Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Celebrity Stage Stories with Jerry Strauss. That's me. And uh, we are here, as always, to talk to all of your favorites from the entertainment world, the worlds of acting, the worlds of music, of comedy, everything that you might like, everything you might enjoy. We're going to get to know your favorites, and we're going to learn about the, uh, the particular brand of stage that they not only perform on, but that they've conquered and uh, made a career out of, uh, out of performing on. So we are going to speak to somebody. She's here with us right now. She is uh, diverse. She's eclectic. She's accomplished. She's done so much in her career that you have seen her and enjoyed her and watched her do. Uh, and we're lucky to have her here. Uh, Darlene Vogel, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jerry. Well, Pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm I'm so glad you are, and this is you know you're the epitome of the kind of the kind of guest that we love on this show because you've been you know as Johnny Cash says you've been everywhere man and you've done so many different cool things <laughs> um, things that we like to geek out on uh, on this show so we get to kind of follow you and we're gonna do a little uh, journey through your career here and, and talk about the things that you've experienced but you know the first thing I want to ask you. Um, I'm always fascinated by people who find their way to acting as you have after <laughs> it's funny, either a career working in modeling or in stand up comedy, which seems very weird, but both of them have that commonality of, a, a, you know, a lot of success stories going into acting from those worlds. Um, how um, did you first come to the world of modeling? And then when did the transition happen for you? I was at school at FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York, and I couldn't afford to stay on. So one of the guys on the floor was like, well, I know a modeling agent. You want to try that? And I was like, sure, I need money. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I got into a modeling agency and I was doing trade shows and showroom modeling, fit modeling. And then from there, I went up to doing catalog work. And then from there, I went with a small agency called Elite Petite. I wasn't petite, but I was 5'7", mm. but I went there because they had a great commercial division and I knew that's what I really wanted to do was commercials and um, mm. and uh, modeling was just kind of like a little stepping stone for it. And as soon as I got into that agent, I started booking commercials right and left. The Milk Does a Body Good campaign was my first national and I just went up from there. Wow. That's, yeah. That's really cool. Do you know... And again, drawing that parallel between modeling, stand-up comedy, and I'm sure some other some other avenues as well. But do you feel like your time in modeling at all, like just going through that process, do you think that prepared you for a world in entertainment, in acting, as far as your approach, thickening your skin, just your attitude towards uh, maybe the rejection that right. can come? That's definitely, you know, a big part of it, rejection. I mean, in modeling, you get rejected. In acting, you get rejected every single day. So um, you really do have to have thick skin and never take anything personal. It's not about you. Or maybe it is. Maybe they don't like your forehead or they don't like <laughs> your hair or they don't like your little pooch or whatever. It's such a, I mean, mostly with modeling, they rip you apart more than acting for sure. But um, I wasn't really a model. I'm not, you know, like um, I, you know, I did a lot of commercial print start, a lot of stuff. But I mean, I still do print work today. It's funny. I had an Amazon campaign all around the world the last three years. Nice. So it's really fun to be able to still do it and still be relevant uh, in my late 50s. So it's crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just going out and hitting the pavement of New York City. That's what makes you tough and get you thick skinned. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Now, I know this isn't the first gig that you booked as an as an actor, so to speak, but we're going to talk about it. You mentioned it before we even started recording, and it, you know it's the inescapable, unavoidable topic when it comes to your career. Uh, Back to the Future, uh, Part Two, yes. was your coming out party on the big screen. Yes. Uh, now. I, I think the question here, the answer is pretty obvious, but I'm going to ask it anyway. At the time, did you feel like 
this would be a role that would have an impact on your life 25 years later. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even mention I was in that movie for years because it was because, you know, after doing Back to the Future and then all the TV work I did, and then I was on Pacific Blue for five years, and then in One Life to Live for two years and forever. I mean, if I even mentioned Back to the Future, it's like, oh, well, that was a long time ago, you know? I mean, <laughs> But now when I mention it, after the 25 year reunion, it, there's just such a surge of new fans. And just, and I think also because with the internet and social media, I think that's why it's just more relevant. And that's how you get connected to people all over the world. But before I had no clue that they, these fans were the way they were with Back to the Future. It's incredible. I get to travel around the, you know, to Paris and England and I get invited to all these shows to meet all these people and it's crazy. What What is that like? Because, you know, that we've recognized on this show before and we've spoke to people before about their, you know, Comic-Con experiences and, you know, we talk about different stages. That's you know, in our opinion, a unique stage unto itself to go out there and to be that person that these super fans want you to be when they get up close and personal with you. How do you feel about that? I mean, is it something that you enjoy on a regular basis or something you have to kind of build yourself up to? Or Yeah, I mean, when you do these shows, it's like, it's just, it just blows my mind that people fly in just to meet you and get your signature. And I'm like, what are you really going to do with all this stuff? You know, I mean, what is, I mean, I, I don't have that um, opinion about any actor. I could care less about getting anyone's autograph or anything, right. but, um, but they do. And the bottom line is if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have a career. Right. You know, the fans are what make you. So yeah. if it wasn't for them, you're done. So you, I appreciate it and I love it. And they're all very, you know, um, just very giving people and just so appreciative and, and makes, you know, when they say you really made my childhood, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, at least you appreciate me. Unlike my children do. <laughs> <laughs> you're here. <laughs> uh, do, do you feel like you have, and I know that you've been involved, you know, you mentioned Pacific Blue, which is a show that you were involved with and starred in for years. But just because of the power of of this movie, do you feel like you have a bond with others who also were on set with you that you directly work with or just generally who are attached to, to Back to the Future too? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I got to see Jason Scott Lee at the 25-year reunion. We hadn't seen each other since the premiere. And Ricky Dean Logan, I, I talked to. All, I just had lunch with him the other day. And Michael Sheffe, who was the designer of the DeLorean, and, um, you know, and um, Harry Waters and and Don Fullalove. It's just, it's, it's, yeah. And I just saw Michael in New York City a couple of years ago, right before COVID. And I hadn't seen him since the movie. And I ran up to him to say hello because, you know, it was just... Yeah, it was a family when we were shooting it. I was on set for two months. It was supposed to be a two-week gig. And every week, they're like, you're coming back. You're coming back. Because the cafe took a month and the flying of the hoverboards took a month. You know, mm -hmm. that Tondra camera, that was a new thing, the split, you know, camera. So that took a long time to light. So I was very thankful. And I still get residuals from Back to the Future, like good ones. <laughs> good for you. Always on. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now, obviously your career is so much more than this movie. So, you know, we got to hit some of these really cool okay. things that you've done. Um, now, Pacific Blue, let's talk about that a little because that was a show. It was on the USA Network, right? Yes. And um, you, that was one of those just ever present shows for a number of years. I remember, you know, USA and, and I think the youngins may not have the perspective in understanding how big those few uh like those few networks that gave us original cable programming how big they were back in the in the 90s and and the even back to the 80s because there there wasn't streaming services and there wasn't a million different channels so these shows that they weren't they weren't the top shows on TV but the ratings they pulled were significant and that was uh that was uh somewhat of a global hit as well right yes it's still huge in norway i mean 
it's they run it every summer and i have so many norwegian fans and i was in australia and get recognized by norwegian people i was in france and i got recognized by kids from south africa and spain and it's still pretty big overseas here not so big um but I knew if we that was the original programming of USA. It was us, La Femme Nikita, and Silk Stockings. And if we got a two rating, that was big, you know. Um, but it was a little bit of a niche show, you know. You didn't have anything like that. It was mindless entertainment. It was so fun to do. But you know, Europeans, you know, overseas, they love Santa Monica Beach and Venice and California. They love watching that kind of stuff. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I just did another signing for Pacific Blue fans, and then and um, yeah, I, it, that was such a great experience. I love being on that show; it was so fun. I mean, for those of for those of you out there who are not necessarily familiar with Pacific Blue, um, but maybe familiar with a show like Baywatch, yeah, very much. I would say kind of the same appeal, right? We're giving the same kind of vibe and the same atmosphere, the beach, and it yeah. becomes this thing that the rest of the world just like loves and almost envies that they could be uh they you know they just love that scene and yeah you guys, well, we got to ride our bikes you know every day <laughs> on the beach and you know and even when i see the santa monica police officer i'm like yeah i, I was a bike cop I mean, I was, <laughs> yeah. and um yeah I mean, street it, cred yeah it was such a great and we had a lot of guest stars on our show that are either big today or were big in the 80s, like the sitcoms and things like that. So we had guests from the Brady Bunch and Eric Estrada. And I mean, all these names. And Leslie Bibb, that was her first gig for a guest star. Um, you know, she's gotten big now. Um, I mean, when I look back on some of the episodes, because it does air like on Tubi.tv and there's other streaming platforms. And right now, actually, they are transforming the old shows into more of a high def format. So it doesn't look so bad when you see it on TV. But um, you see all these actors and go, oh my God, that's so and so, and that's so and so, that's so and so. You know, funny. You anybody? That. Is there anybody in particular that you remember being excited, uh, showing up at, at the set from back then that you had already known and were a fan of? I think. Well, um, I think it was like Cindy Brady because I was such a fan of the Brady Bunch. You know, she was <laughs> on there. Um, it's hard to even remember half of them. You know, Eric Estrada and. I know Paula, my my castmate, she would remember everybody because she has watched the show so many times. I I actually don't watch it anymore, so I don't remember much of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, we've had some great guests. And the one thing that I made sure of, because my first uh, guest star on our TV show was Charles in Charge. And yeah. I just remember how they made us feel like we weren't a part of the cast. And I swore that day, I said, if I ever get on a show, I will make sure every guest star, every extra, every co-star are treated mm. the same. And we had that on Pacific Blue. Anyone that came on, the background, the stand-ins, everybody was treated with respect and we were not higher than them. And that's mm. why everyone loved working on Pacific Blue. That's really great. And, and a great segue. I was going to actually ask you about Charles in Charge next. It's yeah. another show that... Definitely a guilty pleasure for people, you know, of my age or maybe just myself. I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I liked it. But, you know, so many stories have come out from that show over the years and so many rumors and allegations and things of that nature. So so you're saying not necessarily the most pleasant environment to pop in and do a, a guest star. Well, they weren't very warm to us. My friend Tiffany, who was my first friend in L.A., you know, she, we both were guest star, starring on that show. And we're like, gosh, I mean... They don't even like come up to you and say, hey, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm so-and-so, whatever. And I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. You know, I didn't, it was my first um, sitcom to guest star on. And yeah. you know, Scott Baio was annoying. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> That's all I'll say. But um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, just to get sort of the picture of what that show was like back then, was that filmed in front of a studio audience? Yes. Yeah. So that, was that your first experience performing yeah. in front of an audience in general? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was. 
Well, yeah, me... because I had only done like a co-star on The Equalizer and that wasn't an audience. So that was my first audience. And I was like, this is fun because yeah. I never really liked stage. I was never a theater person. And because I, I would just get, if I have to say this line one more time, one more night, I think I would just, you know, no, I love a, a sitcom work. It was, that was like my favorite thing to do. I love the live audience and waiting for the laugh. And yeah, that was my, I love doing sitcoms. But as you get older, you don't get sitcoms as much. You get the crying mother on Lifetime movies. <laughs> <laughs> Your daughter's dying, dead, or missing, or in trouble. That's all you get. <laughs> oh, well, listen, you, you did some great sitcom work here besides Charles in Charge. Um, another classic that people don't think about anymore as much as they should was Coach. You popped on Coach. Oh, which yeah. Was... yeah. That was a fun role. And they were all awesome. I loved working on Coach. Yeah. Yeah, play a little ditzy character is really fun. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And um, Boy Meets World was another yes. one that we mentioned. That you did a great, great cat, uh, crew and cast to work for. Um, I worked on that a few times. Played a teacher in the love interest um, to the other teacher. And the kids were so great. I mean, Fred Savage and Ben Savage, they were always there together. And they were just, they were fun kids to work with. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I remember that was where I learned that you can eat a piece of Trident gum with the paper on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you can just put it in your mouth and it dissolves in your mouth. I go, oh, okay, that's good. Is that, tr is that, is that <laughs> true? Yeah. Yeah. That's where I learned it on the set of Boy Meets World. Yeah. Is that officially recommended by the company? Like, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but they taught me that. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Education. Um, now, Boy Meets World, you were, as you said, you were on it for four episodes, according to my research, and you played a character who was the love interest of uh, Jonathan Turner, who was yeah. the Mr. Turner, the um, English teacher, I believe, if I remember. He was the guy who was the mentor to, um, to oh, I'm forgetting all the characters' names. Yeah, but, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, he was a guy who was an ever present. He was a regular star of the show. Um, and then he kind of disappeared from the show um, at some point. And then he popped back up again. You know, Boy Meets World is one of those shows that, again, not only endured in popularity, but maybe got even more popular after it was off the air to the point yeah. that they did bring it back for, for the uh, revival series, right. Girl Meets World. Um but going back to that time, was there any thought that your character could last even longer? Because that relationship with Mr. Turner was something that kind of, they introduced it and then they kind of ended it, but it seems like it could have gone in a different direction. Was there any? Yeah, I, I, as far as I remember, I don't even think I was supposed to be on it for four episodes. I think they just kept asking me back, you know? Um so I don't remember it being recurring, um, but yeah, I guess, you know, they liked the little storyline, but I think if you, yeah, I don't know why I was even, you know, it was over. I have no idea. I was like, okay, bye. I mean, I don't even ask those questions. So I was like, okay, it was fun. See you mm. on to the next, you know? That's really, and I, I, I've worked with before. I mean, not before, uh, after that as well. Okay. But, you know, going back to your, your attitude about your career and maybe the way you came in and the mindset that you had, that doesn't seem like a super common thing to not sweat, you know, see you later on to the next thing, not really worrying about why this came to an end. Or I feel like that's kind of a really rare beneficial quality that you had in dealing with. It was funny. I just never knew what I, really I was doing. I fell into <laughs> this and I'm like, I don't even know how I'm still getting work. <laughs> You know, because I'm just, I was just, I mean, I just did it. I went on auditions. I, you know, I really didn't take many acting classes and, you know, you, I learned being on set and what to do and to hit your mark and say your line and wait for the beat. And, you know, um, I just didn't know whether to ask and how to network and how to do any of that kind of stuff. I just, whatever my agent sent me on, I went on and that was just it. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. It worked well. <laughs> Very lucky. Yeah. And I had some nice fans of directors or writers or people, you know, that just like to work. I was easy. I mean, I'm like, I'm not a prima donna. I like, you know, I'm just, I'm very thankful for the work that I get, you know, come from yeah, the old really. school of being professional. 
That's really great. Um, a big one we skipped, of course. We have to hit this. This is this is really probably going to be the the show that people are most curious about. Um, another show that is experiencing a resurgence in popularity all over again is Full House, and you right. were um, a part of Full House for just a couple of episodes. But it's the kind of show where even a couple of episodes makes you kind of immortal. So <laughs> yeah. I know that was a funny audition because Jeff Franklin, the executive producer of the show, was actually my neighbor. And oh. he brought me in and I didn't think I was going to get this role. I don't look like Bob Saget's sister. I mean, I may, maybe look like Dave Coulier's sister, you know, but I did not look like Bob. I go, there's no way I'm going to get this role. I walked in. I just kind of said the lines. And he was like, that was a really good audition, darling. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Like, no, really, it was. I go, okay, all right, thanks, bye. And I walked out the room, not expecting and getting that. And and then when I found out, I got it. And then I was working with a monkey. I was so excited, you know, because I love animals. And then when they say, oh my god, Darlene, be careful, because a monkey can rip your face off. And I'm like, oh, jeez, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was. They were a really, really welcoming cast, and um, it was around Christmas time, and they gave you a honey baked ham, and you know all this stuff. But yeah, but yeah, that, that was it. Two episodes. That was it. Um, how did you? How did that experience compare to the other sitcoms you'd been on? You know, we'd had we've had Andrea Barber on the show, um, we've had Jody Sweeten on the show, uh -huh. and we've talked about just the cavalcade of small kids and animals on that show and how just the nature of the fact that there was always small kids and animals to deal with made it a much more uh, a slower process as far as being yeah. able to tape everything they needed is that it took hours i think that's when my brother came to watch or maybe it was my parents somebody of my family came to watch that because my brother did come to my doctor doctor i did that episode and he came to that and they sit in the audience for five hours to watch them tape <laughs> yeah and i was just like i felt so bad that you sit in the audience for that long but i remember you know the olsen twins were so young that you know they had someone off stage say their lines mm -hmm. and then they make a way to beat and then they just repeat it you know and and you're just like that's you know just takes so long you know it does but you know it's a very successful show and people still to this day like my kids friends didn't know i was on full house and they'll see it and they'll darlene were you was that you on full house on the kid and like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? yeah, because that's another resurgence, you know? It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. You could be, I mean, your full-time job at this point could be going to all these different conventions, representing Full House, representing Pacific Blue, representing right. uh, <laughs> everything that yeah. you've done, Back to the Future. Um, your your dance card could be full just from <laughs> that alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you've done all these other things as well. I mean, General Hospital, uh, you popped there. What was that? I mean, that's unlike anything else as far as, you know, the soap opera world is a different taping schedule, a different oh, yeah. feel. Did you enjoy that? Um, well, I did One Life to Live for a year and a half before General Hospital. And okay. so, and I did One Life to Live after Pacific Blue. So it was a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And I had done, I had done like little parts on soap operas when I was first starting out. But to be a regular on a soap opera, you have, I have a whole new respect for those actors because it is grueling. It's like, 30 pages a day of dialogue, or sometimes you do three shows in a day and you have to learn 70 pages, you know? And and I was crying to the producer every three weeks saying, get me off the show, I can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't handle it. And um, I ended up staying on for a year and a half, but then the fans hated me with Bo Buchanan because I was too young for him and blah, blah, blah. And the fans have a lot to say when it comes to casting on that show. And I was fine with it. I was like, thank you. It's been fun. I got to meet great friends. See, I'm going back to California. Um, and then General Hospital was the same producer, and she just hired me on for a couple of small roles. I mean, I, you know, day roles or something. But, yeah, it's always fun. Now that I know it and I know how to do it, you know, it's easier. But it's stressful because you have to do everything in one take, and you do not want to mess up at all. Mm. 
Otherwise, the crew is like, you know, <laughs> when people mess up because it's a long day. Sure. Pressure. Yeah. Pressure. Yeah, pressure of that. But another another uh, skin thickening experience for you, I guess, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can say I've done all these, you know, steps in my career of like, you know, the modeling with the trade shows and the fit modeling and just standing there while they're, you know, putting clothes on me and <laughs> all the way up to like doing a blockbuster movie to like low budget movies, you know, it's just, and I'm thankful for that. It's, it's, you learn along the way for sure. Yeah. yeah. What you want to do and what you don't want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you've been entertaining us all along the way the whole time so uh thank you thank you so much for everything that you have done uh what's coming up what's next what do you still do or what do you want well, to now, do? i mean basically i mean i have a few commercials that are running right now my big one is this eloquiz commercial where you see me i'm lassoing and i get this on this thing yeah it's all pharmaceutical i do so many pharmaceutical commercials it's hilarious i mean it's, I don't know what, but they must like me. I don't know. But, um, and as far as acting, I have not been on a acting stage, I think since my last Lifetime movie and, um, or maybe another movie. I have like three movies that are airing right now that I didn't even watch. And I just recently watched them because I was making my new reel. And even my mom and my friends were like, I never saw any of these. I go, either did I. I just watched them because I was making my reel. <laughs> um, so there's yeah, been a lot of stuff like that. But um, right now, I'm not really the demographic. I mean, I'm always, casting directors bring me in all the time. And I'm either too white or too blonde or too whatever. So it's very ethnic right now. They're checking all the boxes. You know, you have to be ethnically ambiguous or Asian or, you know, brown or black or whatever. So they... If you're the token blonde, you're usually, you know, Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> you, <Right>. know? <laughs> you know, so I can't compete with that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I look at the roles that I've been beat out on, and it was always like an ethnic role or or someone that has a lot more credits than me. Well, look, I mean, and the other thing to remember is we're still coming out of a pandemic, so yeah. production on things is still kind of getting up to speed and and you know, we are taping our auditions in our rooms i mean <laughs> it's so hard to get the feeling you know just to put it across you know when you're not in a room and auditioning in front of people that same energy is missing you know i'm in my last week i had to audition for one of the um new gotham shows and i had an english accent and the whole thing you know i'm in this back house that i tape in and you know, the airplanes are going over, the dogs are barking and the trucks are going by. And and I it was taking me hours to do this and, or I would mess up, you know? And I was like, I can't wait to go back in person and audition because it's just it's so much work, you know? Yeah. Not like yeah. I have a chance in hell getting this role because I was like, <laughs> I, was, I wanted to give 110% because you know, it's shooting in Canada. So most likely they're going to get somebody with dual citizenship or a Canadian um, or a British person because it's a woman that speaks in an authentic British accent, which I can do. Um, my agent was like, wow, you are 97%. There's a couple little tweaks, but but I go, but I've worked with the director five times. So I wanted to do a really good job. And that's the way I am anyway. If I'm not going to if I'm going to go half-assed at it, you know, why do it at all? So that's why I just wanted the perfect audition, you know? So I sent it out and it's out in the ethers and wherever the chips may fall, they fall, you know? And, and it, that's the attitude that got you to the dance, right? I mean, think yeah. about everything we've talked about, just not worrying, not sweating it. That's gotten you some of the most uh, amazing roles that, that people remember you for. Stop worrying about it. You're going to be fine. Right. Yeah. And you have to know, like every actor has to know, it's out of their hands. Yes. You, you give your audition, then move on. It's well, out of their hands. On the same token, though, let, let's finish off with this because I think this is equally important. And I feel like a lot of people are gravitating towards this thought as well, the idea of manifesting what you want into the the ether into the world. So let's look at it this way. Forget about everything that you've been auditioning for in, in the past few weeks, few months. What do you, what is like a goal? What is a dream job that 
you would love to have an opportunity to tackle over the next uh, year or so? Something you've maybe uh, something you've never done before. Yeah, I would love to play a role like Darlene on Ozark, like that white trash, just kick butt. You know, I love those roles. And I look at her and I look at um, Ruth, the woman that plays Ruth. What's her name? That actress that's so amazing. Um, she's also in that Anna. Um... Inventing Anna? Yes, Inventing Anna. What? I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> I know she's don't. so good. But I, I don't like her in the Inventing Anna, but she's so good in Ozark. And she was amazing in Dirty John as well. But um but that kind of just role would be so fun, you know, because everyone thinks of me as like, oh, the nice mom and this and that. But they don't, I mean, like my Back to the Future side or my Pacific Blue side was like this tough, kick ass, you know, girl. And that's who I am inside. You know, I love that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or I'd love to go back to like a, a, a detective show. I don't want to be a star of a show, even though it'd be wonderful. But a recurring is great. You know, being a lead on a show, which I probably couldn't get anyway anymore, but um, being a lead is a lot of work. It's a long hours. It's you have no life. And I've got kids and I've got animals and I've, you know, it's the third part of my life. And I'm just like, you know, but a recurring is great. Where you, you know, you're not working every week, but you have a great role on a great show. That's the key. Okay. It's out there. There it is. Yeah, there it is. It's literally going to be out there as soon as we post this episode. So if anybody's watching this, pass it on. We're going to try and manifest this virtually. Yeah, let's do it. I know. I even wished it on a wishbone last week. Nice. Because nice. <laughs> my daughter were like pulling on the wishbone. I go, please let me win this one. <laughs> Well, look, we're pulling for you. We're excited to see wherever and whenever we are going to see you next. We know it's only a matter of time. So, uh, you know, until then, we're glad that we got to see you and talk to you and, and learn more about you uh, here at Celebrity Stage Stories. So thank you. Thank you. And if you want to look at my new reel, it's on demoreels.com slash Darlene Vogel. Those are some of my new work that's out there. And there's also clips of old work of house and some pilots and other things that I've done. Any social media? I'm on Instagram, Darlene Vogel on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter that much, but um, I do post some new things that I do on Instagram for sure. Okay, cool. Let's follow her. Let's enjoy her. Oh, and, uh, yeah, Darlene Vogel. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Darlene. Been great Gary. to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank All you. right. And thank you guys for checking us out once again this time here. Celebrity Stage Stories. Don't forget, subscribe on YouTube. Of course, we are at youtube.com backslash Jerry Strauss, or of course, on Apple or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Till next time, we'll see you all later. Thanks again, Darlene. Thank you. <laughs>